So, unfortunately, the Supreme Court has overturned Roe v. Wade, meaning that states will be able to ban or severely restrict abortion, and a number of states have already exercised that power, having enacted snapback provisions. So, in this video, I'm going to make my argument for a pro-choice stance by explaining from both a philosophical and religious perspective that abortion is not murder and therefore does not constitute an act of violence that would merit prohibition. I'm going to focus mostly on the conceptual stuff, and to cut down on my rant I've made a little Google Doc of footnotes for places where I felt the temptation to go into more detail. I also encourage you to read and engage with the essays that I'm referencing on your own. I'm doing my best, but remember, I'm just some guy on YouTube, so I'll be keeping count of them as we go along and I'll post links to them in the description. Abortion is a morally complicated topic. For this reason, I don't like it when people on either side of the issue address it in overly simplistic terms. We can take a firm, principled stance and acknowledge the gravity of the issue while also handling it with nuance and empathy for people who may feel differently. There are many ways to look at the issue and say what it is ultimately about. To be sure, women's health and bodily and economic autonomy is what's at stake, and patriarchal norms and forces that seek to subjugate women do prefigure our discussions on the matter. But at the level of moral discussion, the matter of dispute is the question of what constitutes violence. So we can't just end the discussion by simply asserting that women have bodily autonomy. We can and should acknowledge these other aspects, but without sidestepping important questions about rights, responsibilities, and the moral status of the fetus. This moral dimension is important because if abortion constitutes violence, it would therefore be the kind of thing that falls under the purview of the law to restrict. Furthermore, from what I've seen, pro-lifers usually argue for their position by making appeals to the rights of the fetus rather than outright denying the idea that women, generally speaking, have a right to do as they wish with their own bodies. To meet these arguments head on and counter them, we will need to evaluate their claims on their own terms and argue about the moral status of the fetus. So it is this moral dimension of the debate that I will focus on in this video. To be sure, upholding individual autonomy is morally very important, but I'm going to begin by explaining why I think we have to look at other aspects of the issue as well. Now, if you end up disagreeing with me and think that a pro-choice argument only needs to lean on the principle of bodily autonomy to be sufficient, I don't really need to convince you since you're already on my side politically speaking. But I think that learning to engage with the other aspects of the issue can help you become more convincing to the large share of people who feel differently. I also get the impression that, while while some pro-choicers represent their takes simply as commitments to bodily autonomy, deep down subconsciously their stance on abortion is influenced by other things like their ideas about the personhood of the fetus. Indeed, as far back as the 80s, the sociologist Kristen Luker showed how people's stances on abortion correlated with a complex set of views that constituted distinct worldviews, and that most Americans adopted positions between the pro-life and pro-choice extremes. The recent polling data I've seen suggests that this still holds true today, so I think that engaging empathetically is better than just digging your heels in. So, let's begin. Determining what constitutes violence requires us to identify whether there are victims whose rights are violated. For example, I have bodily autonomy, which allows me to swing my fist around in the air, but this does not give me the right to swing it in space that someone else currently occupies. I may protest that it's my right to do so since it's my body, but this defense won't work since swinging my fist there constitutes violence since that would hurt the other person and violate their rights. Likewise, for abortion, we need to explore the concept of personhood and determine whether the fetus has moral rights and whether it can be conceived of as a victim to begin with. Secondly, we need to determine moral responsibilities. I have bodily autonomy, which means I can move as I please and go off to the theater if I like, but if I agreed to be the lifeguard at the beach one afternoon, I have the responsibility to stay there for that time and make sure everyone is safe. It is not permissible for me to shirk my duty and go off to the theater. If I do, and someone drowns while I'm gone, I am culpable. Such neglect constitutes, in a broader sense of the term, an act of violence. We can put an absolutist view of bodily autonomy to the test by considering the case of Accutane. Accutane is a medication for acne that is known to cause severe birth defects when taken by pregnant women. 
Currently, there are legal restrictions aimed at preventing women from taking it while being pregnant, and I think most people would say that this is a good idea. And even those who value individual autonomy highly would morally condemn someone who knows they're pregnant and keeps taking Accutane anyway. So, while bodily autonomy is very important, there are also complexities and limits around it. Let's begin by exploring the concept of moral responsibility further. To do this, we should turn to the famous violinist argument. It comes from an essay by Judith Jarvis Thompson called A Defense of Abortion. In the example, a violinist is stricken with a fatal kidney illness, and you happen to be the only person with the appropriate blood type for the help they need. So their friends kidnap you, knock you out, and you awaken with your circulatory system hooked up to the violinists so that your kidneys can be used to take poisons out of their blood. The dilemma is that if you unplug yourself from them, the violinist will die. Even though the violinist is a person with the right to life, it is not clear that your right to bodily autonomy is trumped by that. Now, if they just need you to be hooked up for 15 minutes and you're on your way, it would be pretty rude to unplug yourself. But what if you needed to remain hooked up for a whole day, a whole week, nine months? You opting to stay there is an act of charity, and there seems to be some threshold after which it is unreasonable to demand that you stay. So we would say that you do not have a strong responsibility to stay. Because the fetus is dependent upon the mother, the case of pregnancy can be framed similarly. Even if we concede that a fetus is a person, it is not clear that the fetus has the right to live inside the mother's body, especially if the pregnancy was not consensual or poses serious risks for the mother. After all, killing in self-defense is okay, and duty to rescue laws do not require you to endanger yourself. This is an important insight, and I think we can use this line of reasoning to argue that at least in many cases the mother does not have a strong strong responsibility to carry the fetus to term. Nevertheless, substantial questions about moral responsibility still remain on the table, and this account suggests that our judgments should vary depending on how, when, and why the abortion is performed. If you want to see a good example of how arguing from this perspective might play out, I recommend listening to this debate between Trent Horn and David Boonin, but I'll give an overview of some of the open questions right here by tweaking the violinist example. What if the violinist needed the help because the donor had just randomly punched the violinist really hard in the kidney? What if the donor had initially agreed to donate the blood but changed their mind? And then, what if the donor needed to mutilate and kill the violinist in order to unplug themselves? And what if the whole process was perfectly safe and would only take five minutes? Likewise, we may be led to view abortions of consensual pregnancies as being different from non-consensual ones, as well as abortions that directly destroy the fetus, like a suction DNA as worse than those that are more like withdrawing support. And if the mother's life is not in danger at all, and the costs to her will not be so great, we may expect more of her. After all, enforceable positive duties as such are acceptable. At what point is refusal to care for a fetus criminal neglect like refusing to care for your children? Lastly, we may view non-procreative sex as some form of potentially criminal reckless endangerment and resulting abortions as somber moral tragedies in a way that I think that most pro-choicers wouldn't accept. We might therefore conclude that abortion should be restricted in many ways and that in many or most situations, someone may have a right to an abortion, but that doing so is substantially morally wrong, thereby stigmatizing it. It should be noted that while Thompson herself argued that women have the right to an abortion, she considered it positively morally indecent in at least some extreme scenarios. So there's definitely more to say about the issue. For these reasons, I think the violinist argument should be bolstered by arguments about the moral status of the fetus. To argue for this position, I think it's helpful to begin by insisting that there is simply a categorical and intuitive difference between an embryo or an early term fetus and a grown person. I'll talk about later term fetuses later on, and I'll use the term fetus or embryo to refer generally to all sufficiently early stages of development. So, an egg is not a chicken, an acorn is not a tree, and an embryo is just not a person. It lacks the physical constitution required for cognitive abilities and the mental world that is required to have any sort of meaningful sense of victimhood. In other words, it cannot feel pain, it cannot desire its own life, and it cannot suffer or anything like that, so therefore it is not violence to terminate its life. I'm going to call this the cognitive faculties view, and versions of this view have been argued 
argued for by many philosophers such as Marianne Warren in her essay on the moral and legal status of abortion. It's intuitive. There's a reason why nobody considers inanimate objects as victims. This account also helps us make sense of our intuitions concerning the welfare of other sentient creatures like intelligent animals and talking trees who make YouTube videos. To be sure, this is not a scientific disagreement about what the facts of pregnancy are, that an embryo has human genetic material or that it will probably eventually under normal circumstances become a person, but it is a philosophical disagreement about which facts are morally relevant. For this reason, we can't just use science to find the scientifically correct answer. What I'm arguing is this, that a fetus is not, in the moral sense of the term, a person. From here, conservatives have a number of responses which I will counter. In so doing, my account will slowly develop and become more sophisticated. And for the record, as a little disclaimer, while I advocate having empathy for average Joe pro-lifers, I have zero respect for pundits who profit off of poisoning our public discourse. So that's where my upcoming mockery is directed. Where do we draw the line? At what exact stage of development does something become a person? What about 10 minutes before birth? An hour? A day? Two weeks? A month? There's no clear line besides that of conception. Otherwise, it's a slippery slope to communism. To this, I would respond that it's true that it's hard to find that exact line where something becomes a person, but that we don't need to find that line. The only thing that matters is that there are clear members of both categories, fetus and person. All categorical perception works this way. What is the precise line at which someone becomes bald? When they lose one hair? Two? Ten? There's no precise line here either, and there are some gray areas. But there are also clear-cut cases. For this reason, we wouldn't say that baldness doesn't exist, and therefore we should have no issue maintaining a categorical distinction between a fetus and a person. Furthermore, birth is not a completely morally arbitrary milestone. In her essay, Of Course the Baby Should Live, Against Afterbirth Abortion, Regina A. Rini points out that once the umbilical cord is cut, a baby becomes biologically independent, acquires new aims, and acts autonomously to satisfy them, whereas before it was completely dependent upon the mother. Moreover, many developmental processes which may be essential for a pain experience begin after birth. To be sure, I think the fetus gradually acquires moral status, so I don't want to just declare open season on babies who are 10 minutes away from being born. But far from being completely arbitrary, birth can be seen as awakening the baby and causing it to be something it wasn't moments before, so it is reasonable to take it into account. Okay, but what is this precise package of cognitive faculties? If you can't name them, then how can you be sure of what counts as a person? And what will prevent us from sliding down the slippery slope towards communism? We don't need to find the exact package of cognitive faculties required for something to be a person or not, just like we don't need to find at what exact point someone becomes bald. For example, I don't need to know the exact recipe of a cake to be able to identify one and to know that it's made out of food. Sure, I might not know what combination of ingredients makes one of grandma's special cakes, but I do know that if I don't have any ingredients or you just hand me a bucket full of wood and nails, I'm not going to be making a cake anytime soon. Whatever combination of cognitive faculties you may suggest, a fertilized egg has none of them, so it's safe to say that it's not a person. Well, science has proven that personhood begins at conception because there's a unique genetic code at that point. Checkmate, Lib turns- oh, oh, never mind. I was scared. I thought I saw Sam Cedar. While scientific claims can certainly be relevant in moral issues, you should be suspicious of anyone who is selling you a scientifically correct moral framework. This usually involves tacitly taking positions on questions of value and metaphysics. Not surprisingly, there are conceptual problems with defining personhood, a metaphysical concept, purely in genetic terms. Firstly, we need an account of why the human genetic code is to be valued so much. Why not value chicken or tree genetics? Genetics higher, or say that certain races or haplogroups aren't people due to their different genetics. And is any body with human genetic material now a person? If you take cells from an organ and hold them alive, or have a cancer cell culture or a tumor with its own genetic profile, is that a person now? 
These are absurd conclusions, and they are derived from an arbitrary moral principle that is not connected to any sensible, morally basic property. Upon reflection, it's clear that we value human life because of properties that emerge from our genetics, like rationality, consciousness, and the capacity for love and not the genetics themselves. A sensible account is going to have to cycle back around to cognitive faculties in one way or another. Well, I just do think that a fertilized egg is a person. I disagree with your perception and see no reason to think that you're right. My wife's a doctor and she agrees with me. This is where I think conservatives take the biggest L in the argument because it is manifestly false. Approximately a quarter of pregnancies end in miscarriages, in many of which the fertilized egg is passed out without the woman's noticing. If you really think that an embryo is a person, you should fish that egg out of the toilet bowl, give it a name, register it as a citizen, and hold a funeral. But nobody really believes this, so they don't behave like that. You could also argue, as Richard Schoenig does, that pro life should have an issue with in vitro fertilization where thousands of fertilized eggs are abandoned. Most, however, don't seem to care. And if you really believe abortion is murder, you should be okay with violence in order to stop it, as some have resorted to. But most pro-lifers intuitively know this is wrong. Furthermore, I think it would be strange to count someone's life as starting when a cell emerges, but their death to be when their heart stops or brain dies. We can perform a reductio ad absurdum by using this infamous hypothetical. Imagine you're at a fertility clinic and a fire breaks out. There's a room with a bunch of fertilizers eggs on a shelf, but also another room with an eight-year-old child who's stuck for some reason. You only have time to save either the eggs or the child. Whom do you save? If you think personhood begins at conception, you should save the fertilized eggs and let the eight-year-old child die. And that would be as close to self-evidently wrong as you can get. Pro-lifers may respond that they save the eight-year-old to reduce total suffering, but we could rework the example to make the kid temporarily comatose or something like that. You may dance around the issue, but further exploration of this dilemma highlights the common intuition that the child's life is just inherently more valuable than that of an embryo. Now, many take this observation and infer that all pro-lifers are being dishonest in their concern for the unborn. I don't think that this is necessarily the case, however. Instead, I think that what's really going on is that they have intuitions about the value of the fetus that could be better explained by some other account that doesn't go as far as to grant personhood to a zygote. But the extreme pro-life framing seems like the only principled account that appeals to those intuitions, so they stick with that since it seems like it's the only game in town. Later on in this video, I'll get to an account that may accord with these intuitions better. It's also worth pointing out that this is a really damning weakness in the pro-lifer argument. Given that the basic mode of moral discourse has been to reconcile and harmonize commonly held moral intuitions, the fact that the very thing pro-lifers are trying to prove, that a fetus is a person Person from conception is so counterintuitive puts them down several points at the start of the half, so to speak. At least for me, the idea that an embryo is not a person has been really hard to shake and anchored me firmly in the pro-choice camp. But that might just be me, so let me know what you think in the comments. Well, the Bible says abortion is wrong, and I'm a Christian, so suck it. I think most pro-lifers have a religiously informed position, and I think that they would be surprised to learn that the anti-abortion position is pretty unbiblical. If you want a more in-depth explanation, I recommend watching Tobiah's video and subbing to his channel for more dank left-wing Christian content. But I'll give an oversimplified overview of the argument here. Firstly, the theme of the breath of life recurs throughout scripture, suggesting that the soul enters with the first breath. Secondly, Exodus chapter 21 verses 22 through 25 treats an injury to a pregnant woman that leads to a miscarriage as property damage rather than manslaughter, showing that a fetus is not a person. Thirdly, the ordeal of bitter water contained in Numbers 5 prescribes a ritualized abortion to be performed upon suspected infidelity. Lastly, it's worth mentioning that in addition to the Bible, the rabbinic tradition poses some other problems to the pro-life view. The Mishnah states that that the embryo is considered to be mere water until the 40th day, and it also prescribes killing and cutting up the fetus to remove it if the mother will otherwise die during childbirth since the fetus is not considered a full person before most of it has emerged. 
It's for these reasons, among others, that at the time of Roe v. Wade, evangelicals largely thought that abortion was permissible in at least some situations, and liberal clergy actually played a significant role in putting forward the idea that women have a moral right to abortion. Now, that's not to say that there was no authentic anti-abortion strain within Christian history, and for that, we turn to a discussion of the Christian tradition. If you want to investigate this in detail, I recommend this book by Margaret Kamitsuka. The ebook is less than 15 bucks on Google Play. This could be a topic for its own video, but I'll give a brief and very oversimplified summary here using this timeline. Here we see that the Old and New Testament give nothing for pro-lifers to work with. However, things change in the early Christian era. The best argument that pro-lifers have is that many early church authorities harshly condemned abortion and called it murder. To that, I respond with a few things. Firstly, the word of these early authorities is not scripture. They were making arguments in light of their medical knowledge and understanding of theology, and their arguments were bad. Looking closer, their stances need to be understood in the wider context of their anti-sexuality, misogyny, and focus on procreation. Sex was only supposed to be for procreation, even within marriage, and women who were not otherwise consecrated to virginity were supposed to procreate. Contraception was literally declared by some church leaders as homicide, or perhaps even worse than that. I'm sorry, but I just can't take these guys seriously. I know Basil's supposed to be great, but they're playing pretty fast and loose with what counts as murder. So if you take these guys as authoritative, you're on the hook for a lot of weird beliefs. Furthermore, there are texts that indicate that some early Christians did practice abortion. This suggests that there may have been a conflict between the hierarchical institution and the body of the believers rather than a universal understanding. All this, along with the erasure of women in the early church, lends support to the argument that this was a patriarchal deviation and not the workings of the Holy Spirit. Also, it frustrates me that many pro-lifers would select the anti-abortion stuff from early church fathers but ignore all the cool communist stuff they said about private property. Be consistent, pro-lifers. To finish the timeline, from the 400s onward, the idea of delayed insolment gains currency and is endorsed by big names like Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas. The basic idea is that the soul enters the body at some time later than conception, and so an abortion done before insolment is not murder, although it may still be considered a sin. There were differing ideas about just when this happened and how serious abortion was before insolment. Some based their judgments on the Septuagint translation of Exodus 21 and thought that the soul had entered when the fetus had the form of a human. Others, such as the Puritans, thought it entered when the fetus could first be felt moving in the womb. Some thought it was still gravely wrong to abort before insolment, and others, like the Puritans again, were very laissez-faire about it. Some renowned Jesuit priests who were condemned by Pope Innocent XI thought that insolment happened at birth. Thomas Aquinas took the Aristotelian view that the fetus gradually moved first from having a vegetative soul, then to an animal soul, and then to a rational human soul. In my view, Aquinas' idea looks similar to the secularly framed idea about cognitive faculties that I've argued for, both in terms of its reasoning and its conclusions, although the time frame is way off in my opinion. He thought insolment happened 40 days after conception for boys and 80 days after conception for girls. I, of course, think it happens much later. Overall, though, I think a delayed gradual insolment makes sense in light of the Christian doctrine of Imago Dei, the image of God. There are different interpretations of the doctrine, but the image of God can be understood as referring to divine, intellectual, moral, and a gentle traits that we find in humankind, such as consciousness, rationality, the capacity for love, and the ability to engage in moral reflection. These attributes are found in grown humans, but not in fetuses. So I argue that fetuses are not in souled people because they lack the image of God. At any rate, despite these varying views, throughout this period the institutional church disapproved of abortion but had a more relaxed attitude toward it than it did in the earlier stages of its history. Next we have the early modern era where the Catholic Church waffled back and forth as 
as it slid more into the anti-abortion camp by papal decree. For this reason, around the time of Roe v. Wade, abortion was seen mostly as a Catholic issue. Generally, evangelicals switched to being pro-life only after Roe v. Wade, and this may have had connections with the development of the religious right as a political unit, which was interested in not-so-Christ-like things like upholding segregation at universities. Today, Christians can be found all across the spectrum. The Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church as institutions have taken anti-abortion stances, although the views of their members have some variation. Most evangelicals think that abortion should not be legal, but there is a sizable dissenting minority and mainline Protestants tend to lean pro-choice. To sum up, being a Christian and being pro-choice are perfectly compatible, and in my view, the pro-choice stance makes much more theological sense. Here's a high-level idea. What about the value of potential life? Many object to abortion because it involves ending the life of something that has potential to become a rational being like you and me. And I've seen two main ways of articulating this intuition. One route is the substance view of persons, championed by Patrick Lee. This view uses the intuition about potential to support a metaphysical claim about the inner nature of the fetus. The other route is the deprivation argument championed by Don Marquis. This argument uses the intuition about potential to support an ethical claim about the importance of future interests, even those held by non-persons. According to the substance view, every human being is a person because they are individual substances of a rational nature. Humans are individual substances, meaning that they are individual things that exist in and of themselves. Since normal, healthy humans grow up to be able to talk, feel, reason abstractly, and deliberate about justice, we say that these are characteristics of human nature, which is a rational nature. In the words of J.P. Moreland, a nature is an ordered structural unity of ultimate capacities. Membership in a rational kind confers upon one moral worth, regardless of whether one actually develops these faculties. Under these terms, a zygote, a fetus, a teenager, and an elderly person, as members of a rational kind, are all individual substances of a rational nature, and therefore people with a right to life. Now, firstly, I don't think that something possesses a nature by membership in a kind, but if anything, it works the other way around. Something falls under a kind because of its nature. This is what allows evolution to work. New species and kinds emerge due to subtle changes in the individuals over time. So I only think it makes sense to talk about individual natures. Secondly, I would hesitate to say that an adult has the same nature as a zygote. I think it involves conflating potential capacities and actual capacities. It's like if you showed up for a job interview for the position of a software engineer having said on your resume that you are an expert computer programmer, when in reality you can't code at all. When they try to test your coding ability, you could insist that you have the potential to code like an expert as entailed by your ordered structural unity of ultimate capacities in that this is just as good as being able to code now, but I don't think they'd hire you. I think therefore that the other route defended by Don Marquis in his essay Why Abortion is Immoral is stronger. His argument is that killing people is wrong largely because you deprive them of a valuable future. The victim misses out on engaging in activities, having pleasures, reaching goals, and so forth. Whether or not you consider a fetus a person, aborting one also deprives it of such a valuable future. Because murder and abortion both share this essential property, they're both seriously wrong. Now, I think that deprivation of a valuable future certainly is a big part of what makes killing someone wrong, but I would argue that this consideration only applies to the appropriate kind of being. Both the deprivation argument and the substance view of persons run the danger of viewing contraception or even abstinence as being like murder, either because one would be depriving the sperm or egg of a valuable future, or because the sperm or egg is an individual substance with a rational nature. 
A defender of Marquis's view might say that abstinence or contraception would be simply opting not to confer a valuable future, which is different from depriving a valuable future from something that already has one, but it is not so clear that this maps cleanly onto contraception and abortion, respectively. Interrupting a couple in the act of lovemaking or using spermicidal gel could be acts of deprivation, and many abortions may be possible to construe as refusal to confer a future as discussed earlier with the violinist example. There is a second and better argument that a defender of either of these views might appeal to. They may argue that a sperm or an egg does not have a valuable future as a rational creature, but rather, in conception, its existence ends and it gives rise to something else that gets the future. So, killing a sperm doesn't deprive it of a valuable future as a rational creature, but killing a zygote does. I actually do agree that neither the sperm nor the egg have the valuable future, Future, but by making this move, the pro-lifer has admitted that mere physical continuity, sharing the same atoms, and metaphysical continuity, being the same being, are different things. This opens the doors for me to say the exact same thing about a fetus, at least in its early stages. It is a different being from the person that later emerges. Bertha Manninen points out the importance of this metaphysical question of identity in her essay, revisiting the argument from fetal potential. The pro-lifer is making a huge assumption by equating the self entirely with the biological organism, whereas I consider a self more as a different kind of being. I consider it to be more along the lines of a soul or an embodied mind. So I think that if you kill a zygote, you're not killing the person that would have been born since that person simply hasn't shown up on the scene yet. For this reason, I find it very counterintuitive to see a huge moral difference between abstaining from sex, having sex using contraceptives, and conceiving but aborting shortly after. It just seems that it's all the same from the perspective of the potential child. So how do we judge between these two views. One problem with reducing identity to biology is that picking a point where a new individual substance emerges starts to get arbitrary. There is no clear moment of conception, and it's also not clear whether a zygote even counts as a distinct individual after conception. Up until 14 days after fertilization, zygotes are totipotent, meaning any of its individual cells alone could divide off and become a complete individual being. In other words, a twin or a triplet. Furthermore, scientifically, it is wrong to think of an embryo as essentially a small person who is autonomously growing and being fed through a tube. In reality, the embryo is more like clay being molded by the mother's womb. The zygote depends on the mother's cytoplasm for cell division, and much of the gene expression and developmental outcomes are decided by the environment, not only by the already present DNA. For these reasons, the substance view of persons and the deprivation argument can arguably only assert the rights of a fetus somewhat later in development, even by their own logic. Equating the self with an organism may feel better to some people because it seems more scientific, but unfortunately for them, you can't avoid metaphysics. Even the definition of an individual organism is somewhat in flux. However you try to solve the question, you are going to have to come up with formal and functional requirements for being an individual being. So for example, we can't say that a bunch of food is a person or an organism because even though it may have the nutrients required to form such an entity, they haven't yet come together to form that entity. And we also can't say that a dead body is a person, even if it has the form of one and physical continuity with one because it has ceased to function as one. But this is essentially the same thing as what's happening in my cognitive faculties account, except I'm talking about the preconditions for the presence of a mind rather than the presence of an organism. So at best, the biological view is just as arbitrary as the view I'm defending. I think it is far more intuitive to see the self as an embodied mind or a soul that has a certain phenomenological and qualitative experience. This can be shown with a version of the philosophical zombie thought experiment like the one David Chalmers presents to explore the concept of consciousness. 
Imagine a creature that appears and acts identically to a human, but doesn't actually have any sort of experience. It doesn't consciously go through any mental states or feel pain or anything like that. Being one of these zombies is no different from being a rock. We would say that the zombie lacks a mind or a soul. Upon contemplation, it becomes clear that it is continuity of this sort that matters when we are talking about a self or the being that persists through the course of of one's life. This mind-centered view accords better with intuitions about why violence is wrong. Killing someone or causing harm is wrong because in a variety of ways there is a subject for whom it is bad. So it does not seem like philosophical zombies would get any moral consideration. Now when it comes to what amount of mental abilities are required, there is some room for debate. Manninen identifies two main different views here. The first is the psychological criterion account which focuses on psychological continuity. Proponents of this view include Marianne Warren, Michael Tooley, and Peter Singer. This view focuses on the existence of psychological properties like consciousness and desire. This view can have some interesting consequences that I'll discuss more later. Another view is what she calls the embodied mind account, advocated for by Jeff McMahon and Michael Lockwood. This account requires only a very rudimentary form of consciousness and focuses more on the embodiment aspect of things. It argues that a being has emerged when the basic structure of the brain has developed. But hypothetically, what if you were asleep or comatose? Consequently, you would not be sentient. Would I, therefore, be allowed to kill you? The, the, the whole phraseology of your position is illogical. My first answer is that the sleeping and the comatose still have some brain functioning, but that misses the point a little bit. We wouldn't say that someone becomes less of a person while they sleep or in a coma. We can use our handy new concept of an embodied mind to provide a better answer. People are the same person when they wake up as they were when they went to sleep or entered a coma. This means that there must be some sort of psychological continuity that persists through sleeping and comatose states. The embodied mind and its essential dispositions are still preserved, and this is the being that we care about, so we don't get to kill it. After reconsidering the intrinsic significance of lobster hierarchies, I have come to recontextualize this discussion in light of its inherent chaotic potential. Jordan, can we get to the point? Oh yeah, if you support abortion, why not infanticide, you neo-Marxist? Pro-lifers who bring up this concern may often be accused of engaging in a slippery slope argument, but they might actually be pointing out a runaway train fallacy, and for good reason. Some people who defend a cognitive faculties view, like philosopher Michael Tooley in his essay Abortion and Infanticide, sincerely argue for the permissibility of infanticide, and others, like Marianne Warren, take a middle ground stance. So this is a completely legitimate objection to raise. And how did these thinkers come to their conclusions anyway? The conclusion stems from the psychological criteria that they set for personhood. For much of the same reason that I have argued that fetuses are not people, they argue that infants are also not people. Let's take a closer look at Michael Tooley's position. Like Marquis, we can explain his ideas as an answer to the following question. Why is murder wrong? One very intuitive answer to the question is simply this. It sucks to get murdered. It's a complete buzzkill. Getting murdered is easily your least favorite thing to do. You want to live, not die. So getting killed would contravene your most basic and powerful desire and thwart all your other desires to do stuff with your life. This explains the wrongness of killing in terms of a plausible basic principle. To use Thule's words, he says that A has a right to X means roughly if A desires X, then others are under a prima facie obligation to refrain from actions that would deprive him of it. There's a quick amendment we should make to this account in order to strengthen it. One might conclude that such an account would deny the right to life from someone who is temporarily suicidal or who is brainwashed by a cult into thinking that a suicidal ritual would give them glory in heaven. We should instead adopt the strategy attributed to David Boonin and appeal to idealized desires. We should think of these cases more like someone who is thirsty and is about to grab a glass of poisoned water. We would do them no favor in handing them the glass since they wouldn't drink from it if they knew it was poisoned. Likewise, the temporarily suicidal person and the cultist are acting under mistaken beliefs about how to achieve their own welfare, which I would say is the more underlying thing they desire. 
From this perspective, it stands to reason that something that is incapable of desiring that its life continue cannot be seriously wronged by being killed. There's a reason why killing a carrot is just not a big deal. The carrot doesn't really care. Thule reasoned that in order for something to desire its own life to continue, it needs to have some sort of self-concept. Otherwise, there can be no content to that desire and the desire can't exist, since you can only desire things you can conceive of. So the right to life requires self-consciousness. As a consequence, infants would not have the right to life since they do not have self-consciousness. Despite this unacceptable conclusion, I think it's important to explore and glean some kernels of truth from this perspective before moving on to a better account. When you think about it, the idea of there being an intermediate moral status occupied by an infant on account of its level of cognitive development is fairly intuitive. For example, you can't hold an infant accountable for misdeeds, and you don't need a baby's consent to administer vaccines or do other medical operations. Babies also don't get the right to vote. They don't have these rights and responsibilities because they don't have the necessary cognitive faculties to be moral agents, give consent, or come to a reasoned decision on who to vote for. And while both are horrible tragedies that I wouldn't wish upon my worst enemy, it seems reasonable to say that losing an eight-year-old child is an even greater tragedy than losing an infant. But we can see the point here without signing off on infanticide. Clearly, there is some kind of misstep in this account. But if we are adopting a cognitive faculties account like the one I've been advocating for, are we doomed to conclude that infanticide is permissible? No, we are not, thank heavens. We have at least a few different moves available to us, and I'll start by naming a couple of them. I think they both have their different strengths and weaknesses, and that we can learn a lot by exploring them. One option for us is to lower the bar. Thule picked self-consciousness as his criterion, but we could argue for a criterion that infants fulfill, but that fetuses do not. Infants are sentient, feel pain, and have rudimentary aims and desires. In contrast with an embryo, there's certainly something that it's like to be an infant. In particular, Regina A. Rini points out in her essay that something may be capable of desiring its own continuity indirectly if it desires things for which living is instrumentally necessary. So a baby with no self-concepts may still desire its mother's milk, and it needs to stay alive to satisfy that desire, so it indirectly wants the continuance of the self. This establishes a clear sense in which the infant is wronged by having its life ended and allows us to set sentience and the capacity for desire as psychological criteria for the right to life. The main consequence of this view is that it requires us to say that many animals also have the right to life. Under this view, hunting and killing a deer is like hunting and killing a baby. Both are murder. The strength of this view is that it calls attention to one of the great moral scandals of our day and highlights a truth that conventional morality overlooks. Factory farming is abhorrent, and you don't need to be a tree-hugging hippie to see the moral force of this consideration. We should be kinder to other living and feeling things. Nonetheless, I actually think that Thule's account explains my intuitions about the lives of animals fairly well, though I wouldn't just blithely say that animals have no level of self-consciousness. I don't see why self-consciousness can't be had in varying degrees. But, at any rate, I do have more of an issue with the intense pain and suffering of animals caused by factory farming than I do with the fact that their lives are ended. I think that their lower level of self-consciousness might be a big reason for that intuition. Another issue I have with lowering the bar is that I don't think that an infant is morally on par with an equally intelligent animal. I think that an infant has substantially greater value and that one could be a principled vegan and acknowledge this gap. So let's explore the next option. We can adopt Marquis's ethical argument while rejecting his metaphysics. The ethical argument relies on us arguing that future prospects can create present interests. This is something that many philosophers reject, but Bertha Maninen makes some counterarguments in her essay. One example that she uses is the right to an education. I think we would all agree that a child has a right to go to school and learn about science, history, math, and more, even though the child may have no present interest in learning about them. We all know that the child will grow up and make use of their knowledge later. So it is perfectly sensible to say that a child is harmed by not receiving an education, even though they have no present subjective interest in that education, 
because they have an objective interest in it. Applying this reasoning to the life of an infant, we conclude that even if it doesn't have a present subjective interest in preserving its own life the same way we do, it has an objective interest in preserving it and is therefore harmed by having its life taken away just like you and me would be. What's left is a metaphysical account for when this being who would be robbed of its future steps onto the scene. We could take an embodied mind approach similar to Jeff McMahon's and say that the being with an objective interest in its own future exists once the basic neurological structures, i.e. the brain, are organized. McMahon suggests that this happens between 20 and 28 weeks, so combining Marquis's ethics with McMahon's metaphysics, we conclude that infanticide and abortion later on in pregnancy would be impermissible, but early abortion would be permissible. This account establishes in a clear and intuitive way how the infant can be seen as a victim with interests that are being violated. It avoids the absurdity of giving significant moral status to a zygote and also clearly establishes the right to life for infants. It seems to my intuition that it is articulating an important truth, and I certainly think that the formation of core neural structures is a morally significant developmental milestone after which abortion should not be taken light-mindedly. But I do see some issues. I'm not sure if the education example is a perfect analogy, since I might say that the education is more so done for the child's future self, not for them currently. Given that they will grow up and thereby benefit, we have accepted that the future person will exist, and so we have a reason to educate them now. It might be that these kinds of future interests gain validity when we take the right to life as given, and that using it to establish the right to life would be circular. I could be wrong about this, but it makes me think. It also seems that this would suggest a sharp jump in the moral status of the fetus from being completely insignificant to being a full person mid-gestation, whereas a gradual account is more intuitive, to me at least. This may lead us to see situations where a pregnancy threatens the life of the mother as very difficult to resolve since both are people, whereas in my view it seems clearly intuitive to subordinate the life of the fetus, even in the late term, to that of the mother. And I don't think that I'm alone in that judgment. Most most Americans, and even large shares of those on the pro-life side, are okay with late abortions if the mother's life is in danger. It also doesn't seem like this passes what I call the standpoint test. If a fetus has a brain in some rudimentary form of consciousness but no content or desires, it seems hard to see a huge difference from its standpoint between being aborted and just not having been conceived at all, since the fetus cannot yet care either way. It may have an interest from some objective perspective but the lack of a subjective interest seems morally relevant to me. So if we're not fully sold on either of these options, where do we go from here? I think that the problem is that we're too focused on whether the fetus is a person or a victim. It is here that I need to point out that regardless of what moral view you take, the moral question is not and has not at bottom ever been just about whether a fetus or an infant is a person or a victim. At bottom, this is a question of value. This is because there is not a logical entailment between conclusions about personhood and conclusions about ethics. To assume so may lead us to, as Tom L. Buchamp puts it, place metaphysics in the service of ethics. We could imagine someone who accepts the metaphysical concept of personhood that applies to human beings. But this person could be a nihilist who doesn't care about anything and insists that morality is all made up BS. So in the nihilist's view, there's nothing wrong with killing, shooting, and stealing as long as you have a good time. When we say that something has moral status because it is a person, what we are really doing is taking the metaphysical premise that something is a person, combining it with the ethical premise that it is wrong to contravene the desires of, cause suffering to, or destroy such a person, and then from there concluding that we can't kill such a thing unless there are other outweighing factors, such as acting in self-defense. Now, of course, I agree with this newfound hidden premise. Suffering and desire contravention are morally relevant, but this leads us to ask whether we can value other things too. Things besides personhood may give a life moral status, and these things may apply to infants. These other considerations in tandem with considerations that we've already identified will give an infant the level of moral worth that we find intuitive, and thereby condemn infanticide harshly enough. 
And this observation is not just important to the issue of abortion, but it applies to all other moral issues. In my view, whenever you reduce morality to any one principle, be it utility, rights, or moral rules, you will end up with absurd answers. I am also critical of what I see as reductive accounts of the good like hedonism, which cares about maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain, and desire satisfaction theory, which only cares about the satisfaction of desires. I voiced this critique in a previous video about psychological and rational egoism. In practice, many things seem to be intrinsically valuable in ways that transcend the pleasure or desire satisfaction derived from them. Excellence in a craft or activity, the scholarly pursuit of knowledge, and the creation of art are some examples. So what are some other things that could apply to an infant? We can return to the Christian doctrine of Imago Dei to find another sort of attribute that gets overlooked in cognitive faculty accounts. Moral qualities. A being which is able to be a friend, contemplate morality, and feel love gains value as such. Conversely, we could imagine a creature which is cognitively complex but is a moral monster. It relishes in causing suffering and it can feel no inkling of love, sympathy, or compassion to anything but itself. It does not seem that such a creature is worth very much moral consideration, even if we acknowledge that it is intelligent, feels pain, and has a self-concept. Even if we were fully insulated from the harm it may cause, offing such a creature would not be as heinous as murder, although we may give it some consideration on account of its ability to suffer nonetheless. This intuition may explain why we feel differently about animals like dogs. Dogs seem to have a special capacity to feel love and bond with us, even in comparison to similarly intelligent animals. Some of these moral qualities may apply to infants who may feel love and bond with their mothers in a special way that is morally relevant. Virtue theory can weigh in here too, and the philosopher Rosalind Hursthaus makes that case in her essay, Virtue Theory and Abortion. From the perspective of virtue theory, we ask not what the biological facts surrounding pregnancy and the development of the fetus say about its moral status, but rather how they factor into the practical reasoning, actions and passions, thoughts and reactions of the virtuous and the non-virtuous. She writes that abortion should be taken seriously because like procreation, it connects with all our thoughts thoughts about human life and death, parenthood, and family relationships. Having the correct attitude towards a fetus and a newborn infant may be a constitutive part of being virtuous and therefore living well. I think we may miss out on something important about the human experience if we view an infant's or a fetus's value only in terms of its capacity to suffer. In my view, this applies not only on an individual level, but also on a societal one. We may gain as a society if we appropriately value the lives of infants and perhaps the unborn by establishing the correct norms. Infants may get special moral consideration due to factors that come from the relationships and context they are in. I think most people would say, for example, that you have special moral duties to family members or your parents or to your friends. Having carried the infant for nine months in the womb, a relationship has been materially established. Likewise, there may be a moral difference between our pets and wild animals since we formed relationships with them. Valuing such relationships intrinsically may be part of living well. Human lives may also also be more meaningful since each one has its own purpose, whereas animals are bred for our own designs. It's also reasonable to value the life of an animal differently if it is an endangered species or if it's an invasive one. So by similar logic, we can say infants are socially valuable because society depends on them for continued existence. As I have explained, I think that there are multiple ways of appealing to the intuition of potential, and I do think that Marquis's argument needs a metaphysical account to complement it. I also think that having current subjective interests is a morally relevant criterion. Perhaps the sort of objective interest identified in the right to an education analogy has some weight but less weight than a subjective interest. But I think that in one way or another, there is some validity to the relevance of potential. I would certainly agree that an infant's potential to grow up and develop the complex cognitive faculties of adult humans is a morally relevant difference between it and animals of currently similar intelligence. So in conclusion, I would say that metaphysical details aside, an infant is a valued life. Whether we consider it to have developed to the point of personhood just yet, it is certainly an embodied mind. There's someone there and that's a morally relevant difference. 
It is best to say that being an embodied mind is a necessary condition for having the right to life, and the presence of such a mind is inferred from and requires having some baseline level of cognitive abilities. Lastly, when it comes to determining whether something has a right to life, we can't just look at one thing. It seems to be a flowing together of a variety of different considerations that give something a right to life. So now that I've identified several moral considerations that we can appeal to in order to reach intuitive conclusions, I would like to show what a pluralistic account looks like when you put it all together. There are two major structural consequences to this pluralistic take. One, there is considerable room for disagreement about which among many things to take into account as morally relevant and how to weigh them. For some, the virtue theory concerns may be very important or not at all. Others may see reason to value biological human human life as such, and others not so much. I make no claim to having a perfect system of evaluating these considerations. 2. There's a lot of room for intermediate stances. Many feel like the only morally principled stances are either extreme pro-choice ones or extreme pro-life ones, but this is hard to square with the moral intuitions of most Americans who seem to fall somewhere in the middle. I therefore consider this to be a key strength of this account. So what does this look like in practice? I think this account bolsters a strong or moderate pro-choice view. For example, I think that the fetus slowly gains moral status through the course of its development. Early on, I have no issue with abortion for convenience. But then the fetus starts gaining moral status, and I really start raising my eyebrows a little bit around month five upon quickening, and I think that a fetus starts getting more serious moral status when we think that it can feel pain. There's a lot of disagreement about this, but there's good evidence that the biological system for feeling pain is ready by 26 weeks. Some argue that pain can be felt earlier, and others argue that pain can't be felt at all before the third trimester. This is certainly not my area of expertise, but I think that the third trimester is a reasonable milestone to set. I think from then on until birth that abortion is still acceptable in cases where the mother's health is in danger, but I would view it as morally wrong for someone to just stroll in and kill their fetus at seven and a half months pregnant simply because they wanted to ride a roller coaster on its opening day or something like that. However, I'm uncomfortable with strict regulation around that since I wouldn't want to create any legal gray areas that may impede legitimate abortions, and since, to my knowledge, this hypothetical capricious late-term abortion isn't something that really happens anyway. I would rather leave it between the woman and her doctor. And then of course, things change after birth where I hold infanticide as indefensible. Within the bounds of my basic account, there is still plenty of room to disagree about what the morally relevant milestones of fetal development are and how to weigh them against the rights of the mother. In particular, how to handle late-term abortions may merit serious discussion. My basic account also does allow for fetuses in the early stages to have some moral consideration, like from a virtue theory angle. I would invite any pro-lifers to consider whether any of these secondary moral considerations more accurately captures your intuitions on the subject. If so, you may have reason to want to reduce abortions without banning them by doing things like alleviating the socioeconomic difficulties that lead to abortion. That notwithstanding, I do not think that this account allows for the extreme pro-life view that abortion is murder from conception. That's because, as I've shown throughout the video, if we pick any of these considerations that do apply to an embryo and try to use them to put abortion on par with murder, we'll end up with really bizarre conclusions, such as sperm being people. The fact of the matter is that, at a material level, early abortions are categorically different from murdering a born human being. Zygotes don't have the biological constitution required to feel pain, suffer, have minds, or bond with us like the born do. I think it's reasonable and intuitive to believe that moral judgments should reflect that material reality. In my view, to take the conservative position would be to make the same mistake as philosophers like Michael Tooley who reduced the issue to just one thing, except it would be even worse because it would seem far more arbitrary and be less connected to basic moral principles than his account. As I've explained over the course of this video, it's reasonable to say that some basic level of sentience is a necessary condition for the right to life. Furthermore, from this more pluralistic approach, the autonomy and freedom of women will naturally weigh very heavily on the scales and tip them in favor of a pro-choice position. This is backed up by Professor Kristen Luker's research, which has shown that, at least historically, pro-life stances correlated with rigid black and white views on morality, whereas pro-choice stances correlated with pluralistic accounts more like mine. 
And with that, I conclude my thoughts on the morality of abortion. Thank you so much for listening. Please leave a comment and hit like, subscribe, and the little bell icon to get notifications. It makes my day to get that kind of encouragement. Seriously, there were some really supportive comments that really gave me the energy I needed to keep going. If there are any other issues you'd like to hear my take on, or if I've misrepresented anything, please let me know in the comments. Also, I've provided links to my sources and footnotes in the description. Until next time, this has been a Nerdy Tree production. Thank you.